Today's episode of 83 Weeks is brought to you by HideFromRent.com. If you're still a renter, what are you waiting for? First Family Mortgage can make it fast and easy for you to get out of that old apartment and into a brand new house. Now, maybe best of all, you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. That's right. You can get into a house with no money down. You couldn't even go find another apartment that cheap. You'd have to pay your first month's rent, your last month's rent, and a security deposit. But at HideFromRent.com, you can get in with no money down. And you don't need perfect credit. Even credit scores in the 500s will qualify. So if you've been late on a credit card here or there, maybe you had bankruptcy in your past years ago, whatever your situation is, First Family can get you on the right track to get out of that cramped, tiny apartment and into a brand new house. Find out how easy it is. Go to HideFromRent.com right now. There's a simple form there, just a couple of clicks. You tell us what you want your new house payment to be. And you're off to the races. Go check it out right now. It's hidefromrent.com. And a MLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? Well, this is uh, John Smith. Eric Bischoff isn't here today. He's uh, unavailable, so I agreed to stand in for him. And what are we doing today? Well, I'm glad that you asked Mr. Smith, because, uh, we're covering fall brawl, 1998, which is a flaming turd of a pay-per-view. And we're going to get to talk about the ultimate warrior in WCW. So it makes sense that Eric would want to lay out this week. Yeah, it does make sense. But unfortunately I, I can't keep a straight face for more than a couple seconds. You know, a flaming turd, you know, I, I, I just got done watching it about an hour ago and I got to tell you. This is going to be, this is going to be a tough couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both know that. In fact, I, I sent out a tweet. I don't know if you saw it or not, just a little while ago. You know, asking if anybody would be willing to sit in for me on this week's podcast, because I was surmising that you were probably sitting at home in a velvet robe, si- sipping on a Lagunvula Scotch, and smoking a Cuban cigar, just waiting, chomping at the bit to do this this episode i actually go the other way man i feel like you were in a bad spot and i texted you early this morning and reminded you what we were covering and i needed you to watch it and then i apologized because i know that this wow i mean war games was but we'll get into it i guess we should explain what the hell we're talking about it's fall brawl 1998 and believe it or not it took place almost 20 years ago we're coming up on the 20 year anniversary on september 13th And you guys were in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And of course, the Carolinas were famous for the birthplace of Jim Crockett Promotions. And then, of course, War Games was a Dusty Rhodes creation. And man, this was just bowling shoe ugly, to say the least. I guess. Can we talk about the good stuff? I mean, there was some good stuff in it. Oh, absolutely. And, and, And it's worth mentioning that while creatively we may have had some bumps in the road, especially when it came to Warrior and, well, there's a couple other things. Business is still on a high. Goldberg had just become the world champion. You know, wrestling is super, super hot. You guys are very, very profitable. It's not all bad, it, especially even when you can compare year over year. Of course, we've talked famously about what a critical year 1997 was for the company and how it's my favorite year. Man, everything's up even from 97. You look at, say, September of 97 to September of 98, and your average attendance was going from 6,800 to over 8,000, so an 18% increase. And then you saw the exact same thing with the gates. They were 132000 bucks at the gate. Now it's $169,000, which is up 27%. You're selling out a lot more house shows. Your ratings are up 43%. You're clicking on all cylinders, but for whatever reason, this show... Eh, maybe not so much. And when we start, and, and, and maybe this is me stepping out of turn, and I, this is a very macro question, I guess. But when you watch this show and you know about the disaster that's going to happen at Halloween Havoc 98, which we'll cover next month, and you know about the Goldberg shock stick thing in December, and you know the finger poke of doom is in January, creatively, does this show start to feel like you guys are spinning out of control a little bit. Spinning out of control isn't the right way to say it, but it does, I think, illustrate the 
point that I've made multiple times on these shows, and I really don't want to keep making them because it sounds like, you know, whiny shit, um, and, and like I'm making excuses, but this was, again, keeping everything in context, because as we all know, boom, boom, context, context is, is king. king. That's it, man. But, but it's also true. This is about the time where I, I took my eye off the ball creatively and really started digging in against what was about to happen with, you know, AOL Time Warner and in, in the merger and all of things that started occurring as a result of that. Um, I definitely, you know, and there's, it's not an excuse. It's just a fact. If, if people want to know what was really going on behind the scenes, and again, you can go to Guy Evans' book, you know, Nitro, The Incredible Rise and the Inevitable Fall of Ted Turner's WCW, and it's all there in black and white. It's 800 pages, whatever, you know, 120 different interviews with people who were really there, not some Dave Meltzer bullshit or whatever. Um, that's what was happening. And, and I, I lost contact is the best way to say it. I don't want to make it sound. I don't want to paint the picture like, okay, you guys go do creative and I'm going to go fight this war over here. That wasn't it. I was trying to do two things at once. I was trying to wear multiple hats. Um, and I just did a horseshit job. You know, that's all on me. I'm not putting it off on anybody else. But that's really what was happening. I've told a story before um, how in August of 98, I almost quit. I mean, I went home after a meeting uh, where, you know, the handwriting, you know, began. It wasn't, I wouldn't say the handwriting was on the wall, but there was enough movement um, that I didn't understand that I started, my instinct kicked in and I started to feel like sh shit's about to change, but I couldn't really articulate it and, and really see it the way I needed to see it in order to make a big move. And I stuck around, but this, this is, this is that time. This is, that's what was going on. And I, I just, and especially after seeing the show, I mean, it was so discombobulated is the only word that comes to mind. It was just incoherent in many respects. There was some, there were some good things, you know, and as I watched it today, getting ready for you and your velvet robe and your cigar and your 16 year old logging Vula scotch. I was, I was saying to myself, I know he's going to kick my ass and I know I deserve it, but there were some bright spots and I'm, I'm, you know, we'll talk about them as we go on, but this, this was a hard one to watch. And, and <laughs> I want to apologize for all those fans who were affected adversely by this. I do want to mention, you know, the full details on that book. We didn't really talk about it, but without fail, multiple times a day, every day at Starcast, someone came over and, and mentioned how great that nitro book is, uh, it's called nitro, the incredible rise and inevitable collapse of Ted Turner's WCW. But all you need to know is WCW nitro book.com guy Evans has put on a masterpiece. Um, I mean, look, guys who are in the business, I talked to Raven at one point and he said, Hey, what'd you think of that new nitro book? And he said, man, I learned a lot in there. And even Chad Diamati was a, a lot of my emails are in there. I don't even know how they got in there. This was the talk amongst the boys. And if you want, uh, another level, almost a college level analysis of what's going on in WCW in this era, it's the perfect companion piece for our podcast. It's WCWNitroBook.com or it's on Amazon. Just look up nitro book and you'll see it. Let's talk about, you know, I guess the, the very beginning of this is when you guys started to run fall brawl in Winston Salem. And we've talked a little bit about how you guys had, you know, folks who would schedule the pay-per-views years in advance or certainly months in advance, but there started to be themes. We would see the MCI center get Starcade a lot. We would see fall brawl happen in Winston Salem in 96, 97, 98, and 99. Is this out of a relationship with a building manager and the company or who makes those decisions? It does feel like war games in the Carolinas make sense, right? Yeah, it, it does, and and I knew that this question was coming, obviously, and I, I think it's a combination of two things, really. One is, and we, you and I have touched on this a little bit in the past when we were talking about Road Wild, you know, one of the biggest challenges of increasing pay-per-views from four, which is where they were at when I took over the company in 93, to 12, which is where they ended up being in 98, and probably prior to that, actually, 90, 96, 97, um, was that, you know, pay-per-views 
had to have their own identity. They had to be branded. They had to feel unique. And part of that, not 100% of it, but part of that was making sure the local audience felt a certain amount of equity in those pay-per-views. So there was value, at least theoretically, and in most cases it, it worked out practically as well. But there was value in branding certain pay-per-views in certain markets. We did it with Halloween Havoc and MGM. Um, you know, the be- you know, Bash at the Beach obviously moved around to different beach locations. And that was a lot of those um, decisions were also based on just production parameters, you know, because only certain venues are remotely close to a beach and certainly doing them outside was limited. But for the most part, we tried – as often as we could to brand a pay-per-view with a specific location. So the local media, local fans, everybody knew that that was kind of their pay-per-view. There was a loyalty, um, at at least an intention to build loyalty to specific pay-per-views in certain markets. Now there was also a practical, um, reason for that. And the practical reason was if you knew 12 months in advance that you were going to book a building, you could negotiate a better deal. If, if we could go to a, a building owner and say, look, we're, we want to come here a year from now and we'll book it in advance. I knew that you were good for the money and you weren't going to cancel. You could negotiate a much sweeter deal than if you called at the last minute three or four months later and say, hey, you know, we're desperately in need of a building and can you squeeze us in? Well, of course they can, but you're going to pay a premium for that. So there was a practical and a and a, um, a, a tactical reason that kind of went into those decisions. So let's talk about the actual performance of the show. It gets a 0.7 bar rate, which uh, translates to roughly – 3 million and change in pay-per-view revenue. And we're coming off of road wild 98, which I'm sure we'll cover another time. Of course, most people remember that show for Jay Leno. Are you feeling like, you know, and I don't want to get too in the weeds on that. Cause I know we're going to talk about Leno another time. Are you feeling like the Leno situation or experiment was a success at this point? It was. It, it was for me. It might not have been from a wrestling fan's point of view, which I understood going into it. We talked about it before. We'll talk about it again in the future. But from a business to business point of view, uh, we 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 got a tr- we got a ton of uh, shit. I actually kicked Jay Leno off of his own set on the Tonight Show. I mean, we got so much press and so much value for that promotion that we couldn't have afforded to purchase that. Yeah, it was already a success from a business perspective, from a consumer's per- perspective. Uh, eh, you know, we took a hit for that, but the trade-off was what was definitely worth it. But yeah, long story short. Yes. I, I felt very good about it. I do want to ask about some of the, um, the behind the scenes things that were going on during this time. Lex Luger had extended his contract for three years in this, in this time frame, And you've gone on record a lot about the way he was hired in 95 and what that contract looked like three years later, had your opinion changed on Lex? Had your working relationship changed? Had he, had he demonstrated greater value? Did a complete 100, not a not just a soft 180 degree turn. It was a hard, abrupt 180 degree turn. I was, uh, you know, business wise, I was a fan of Lex, you know, personally, I didn't, I still didn't really connect with him very well. He was still, uh, he was Lex. I mean, it was his personality. There was nothing wrong with it. Not everybody is a social butterfly or, you know, the life of the party and, and, you know, the guy that walks around the locker room and shakes hands with everybody and, you know, does the politically collect wrestler union thing. Um, Lex was different than that. But when it came to business, I had, I did a complete 180. He was easy to work with. He contributed, you know, in, in a constructive, productive way. A lot of guys would, you know, they would they would consider, you know, contributing, bitching and moaning and trying to manipulate and change things for their own personal benefit or agenda or in ways that they thought might position them better um, going into a contract negotiation or just, you know, elevating themselves, you know, in, in terms of storyline and spotlight. 
whereas Lex uh, was one of those guys who would offer up and contribute things that was obviously, to me, intended to make the product better. And by that time, when he was up for renewal, I was uh, not a fan of him personally because we just never really connected, as I said. But from a business perspective, I was 100% behind him. What about uh, Ray Mysterio at this time? Ray was going to be out with um, some knee injuries. He had a, a surgery done in August, and this feels like one of many. Did you start to worry about your long-term future with Mysterio here? Or was that even a concern or something that's sort of in your, in your view? No, I mean, yes, I started out to say no. Um, yes, it was a concern, but not for the reason, which is why I started to say no, not because of an injury situation, but l- let me step back. You know, the whole, um, the whole addition of the Lucha guys from Mexico was really spearheaded. Well, it was spearheaded by me, but obviously I had to work with somebody who could help manage that and execute that on the Lucha side of the equation. And that person was Conan. And now Conan and I are tight. We're friends, have a lot of respect for Conan now, but you know, even on Conan's show, which I've done a couple of times, um, his podcast, you know, we've both admitted that, you know, there were times, you know, 20 years ago when we were, you know, button heads like crazy and we definitely had different agendas. Well, Conan's agenda, like so many other wrestlers and performers at that time, was to enhance his position and his leverage. And Conan was pretty good at it. I mean, he was very creative and he he orchestrated a scenario with a lot of the, the luchas, the guys that we're bringing in from AAA and from Mexico outside of AAA, where he was kind of the godfather. You know, another, he was the gatekeeper. You, you didn't do deals with them. He actually convinced some of these guys who could speak English to pretend they couldn't so that he could always be in every conversation. And that way he could kind of influence or advise them as how best to you know, handle situations. I mean, Kone, he was a master. He was a, he was a great worker, right? He had me fooled. And as a result of that and, and Conan kind of insulating that talent that we were bringing in from Mexico from me and from others, not just me, you know, from some of the producers or booker, or excuse me, agents, you know, Terry Taylor and others. Um, it became, a, it became a problem in, in, Conan did a great job of manipulating and leveraging. Leveraging is a better word. Sounds like a great you know, strategy in business. But Conan did a great job of leveraging himself with the rest of that talent and created a lot of chaos and confusion and separation in, in many respects and heat. It all leads to heat. It all leads to a problem in terms of managing talent. And, you know, Ray was probably one of the first ones, not the only one, but certainly one of the first ones where that situation really began to manifest itself in an obvious way. Talk to me about Eddie Guerrero. I know we're going to do an Eddie Guerrero show sometime, and I'm sure we'll get the full story on the whole coffee incident. So let's table that for now. But it comes out in the dirt sheets that there was a, a quote unquote shoot speech from Eddie Guerrero, where he's sort of cutting a promo for the locker room. But then a lot of people start to question as to whether or not this was a real speech or if this is something he had coordinated with you ahead of time. And this is a, an era where you guys start to sort of blur the lines and for lack of a better word, quote unquote, work the boys. What do you remember about this Eddie Guerrero impassioned speech to the locker room? Is that something you and him worked out ahead of time? I wasn't there, you know, so I don't know what he said. Um, I don't, you know, Eddie, Eddie, <laughs> Eddie and I never really orchestrated, you know, anything. We never, Eddie and I never collaborated behind the scenes and said, okay, let's work everybody. Let's, let's, you you know, kind of a la Brian Pillman. We never did that. You know, there were situations, you know, the coffee incident being one of them that, that were organic and real and happened. And after it was over, we said, okay, what's the best way to handle this? But there was never any real, um, orchestrated, crafted, 
manipulation of the boys um, or the locker room, as dirt sheets often like to refer to them, you know, the boys and all that. That, 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 that didn't happen. Now, you know, if Eddie on his own did something and, and tried to cover um, or explain, I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know what, what was said in the locker room. Uh, I don't even know if it was said. It's being reported, I guess. Um, but I certainly wasn't there. I wasn't one of the boys in the locker room. Well, unfortunately, you did help bring the warrior back. Uh, August 17th of 1998 is when we receive the warrior in WCW. And it's a 20 minute segment, which is a real number, but it draws an incredible 6.4 rating, which at the time was the highest rating in the history of Monday Night Wrestling. Let's not skip over that. I mean, that's a show in and of itself. No, that's the, that's what I was going to say is I feel like, I mean, do you want to do the whole warrior show now? Or do we want to come? No, back we don't want to do the whole warrior show. Now I want to do that fucking 20 minutes now. Well, I mean, let's that talk 20 about minutes it. was the longest 20 minutes of my life, but for some reason it got a rating. I mean, how do you explain that? People were just curious because they hadn't seen it. Yeah. Or- yeah, there was a lot of anticipation. Look, you know, Warrior had a lot of equity built up within WWE audience or WWF at the time. The audience, I mean, he was a, a known commodity. He was a major brand. There was a nobody would have ever expected, you know, with all the heat between him and Hulk. I mean, there was all kinds of, you know, built in natural, you know, promotional, you know, effort without having expended any promotional effort on our part. It was automatic. So I think the the wrestling audience in particular wanted to see what the hell is going to happen when these two come together. Because, it was, again, because it was so much natural heat and story from WWF. Know, just true. because you get a good rating. You know, I used to tell people all the time that we're so focused on quarter hours and all that kind of stuff. And, and here's what – this – this used to drive me fucking nuts, you know, especially when it didn't matter. Not especially, but, you know, dirt sheet writers and, you know, wrestlers who were trying to use ratings to justify their positions. So if, you know, wrestler A was trying, to, you know, in the middle of a contract negotiation and say, it, it, you know, typically this is what I would hear. And I'm making this shit up. Like I'm not pointing to any one person, but it would sound something like, yeah, but Eric, you don't understand. Two weeks ago, I had the highest quarter hour against WWF that we've seen in six months. Okay, that's there's a kernel of truth in that. There's a fact there that needs to be acknowledged. However, you know, upon further explanation or or discovery, one would find that in a quarter hour, which is 15 minutes, there might have been two or three other things happening. Right. And it's easy to take credit. You can easily say you can go buy yourself a T-shirt that said, I got the highest quarter hour in six months. Doesn't necessarily mean you drove it. You just happened to be there. Number one. Number two, you have no idea what was going on in, in the on the rest of the cable, you know, network at that time. WWE could have been, you know, off the air and there could have been a dog show. Or they could have had just a horseshit, you know, goofy you know, Duke, the dumpster drowsy, you know, doink match going on. Who knows what was going on at the time? So it's people that look at quarter hours, like we're talking about right here and go, wow, 6.8. That, that suggests it should have been successful. It's a nice thing to have. And it it does have some impact on your total rating for the hour or two hours. But I used to tell people, (laughs) it's like, great. It's, here's the here's an analogy, and I'm going to go in the weeds a little bit on this, but it's important because there's a saying, Conrad, you've heard it, you know, numbers lie, liars use numbers, and it's it's very true. Ratings are the same way. Ratings can lie. Ratings can tell you whatever you want them to tell you, right? Particularly when you start breaking them down and attributing certain things to them. A great example of that in real life is every radio station that comes to my office to try to get me to advertise says, oh, we're number one, but you know, literally every station in town can't be number one. But when you get down to the silliness of, well, we're number one in our demo, which is 
women 18 to 34 who are cat owners and drive a BMW. Okay. Now you're number one. <laughs> there you go, brother. Then you, then you, then you're feeling me. And I appreciate that because sometimes I try to explain this to people and they go, yeah, but I don't get that. But I, I used to tell people it's great to get a great rating unless the product is the shits. All right. And then it's a little bit, here's an analogy, here's a parallel. It's like opening up, you have a grand opening of a restaurant. You've been working hard. You've hired the chefs you think are the best chefs. You've hired the best staff. You've had some soft openings, you know, with friends and family and, you know, other industry people. And you've gone through all of the motions and you spend a fortune inviting all all the, you know, the, the local market to try out your great restaurant and everybody shows up. That's a great rating, right? If you're a restaurant owner, everybody, you got standing room only reservations are, you know, three weeks behind. Everything is great until someone gets food poisoning. Right. And, and then they all, and they all end up in a hospital. And that's kind of what happened here with this 20 minute segment with warrior. Everybody showed up. They were excited as hell. They couldn't wait to see this natural, you know, build up between Hogan and warrior. What the hell is going to happen next? And then they all went home sick. So that great quarter hour rating was actually one of the worst things that could have happened to us. As you're watching it, are you, I assume that when this segment's happening, because of the big investment you undoubtedly have and all the effort that went into it. Are you like curling up in the fetal position? Do you see it slipping away? Are you watching in the gorilla position on a monitor? Talk me through that. And I'm a little confused right now. Are you talking about when I was in the ring when, when warrior made his debut or are you talking about when I'm watching on, on television either or, or when, when, when do you know? Oh no. I knew when he made his debut. Oh no. I I knew we were in trouble when, when he came out and we had, you know, talked through his promo again, we weren't very scripted and in warrior's case, it wouldn't have mattered. Anyway, you couldn't have given him a script and he could have, he couldn't have stuck to it. But now we're talking about his first nitro appearance. I just want to make that clear. So we don't lose the audience or confuse them. That's when I knew I was in trouble. Everything that <laughs> else, everything else that happened after that was a degree of, you know, how bad it was going to be ultimately when he first showed up and we talked through, we walked through it, we blocked it. Everybody had a pretty good idea of what that first promo was going to be. And we knew that we had about eight to 10 minutes. Now we had flexibility because again, we worked for the network that owned us. So there was, there was a little bit of margin for error, you know, even live, but that, that first promo going back to, to his first appearance on Nitro was only scheduled to be about eight minutes and somewhere along the 20 or 22 minute mark when Hulk and I are standing there looking at each other in the ring going, what the fuck is he talking about? Where, where's this go? I mean, we were completely lost. So was the audience. Craig Leather was screaming in my ear. Craig Leather's a director. I had an IFB in my ear at the time. We were going so far over even the the margin for error that we had built in. That first promo that, that Warrior did ended up being, I think it was beyond 20 minutes. I think we were like 22 or 28 minutes, which for a promo, I don't care who it is. That's how, that's... <laughs> So yeah, everything else that happened after that was just a certain degree of confirmation that this was going to be a bad deal. Now let's talk about why you didn't promote it. Because I think in hindsight, a lot of people sort of think that you guys had built this up and promoted it for a long time, but that's not really the case. Um, this was a surprise appearance and it was that way because according to the dirt sheets, there was a lot of wrangling behind the scenes Wade killer would write WCW did not hype his appearance ahead of time. Since they were fighting a legal injunction by the WWF, trying to prevent warrior from appearing based on their legal battles with warrior stemming from his departure from the WWF two years ago, had the WWF not muddied the waters until late last week, WCW still may have chosen to downplay the warrior until he actually showed up. So chat me up. What do you remember about his situation that I guess really became you guys situation with the WWF? 
Yeah, there were there were some challenges there. And again, WWE took advantage of the fact that we were knee deep in copyright and trademark infringement litigation. And quite honestly, their lawyers, Jerry McDivitt, um, was doing a really good job of kicking WCW's ass or Turner Broadcasting's ass would be more accurate. Um, so we were gun shy and we weren't as inclined to go, you know, screw it. We'll we're just going to do what we're going to do and see what happens, which would have been my mentality and my approach to all of this. But by that time, we were knee deep and spending lots of money and lots of time uh, on that litigation. And as a result, I had, and we talked about this in pre previous shows, I had Turner Legal, which didn't report to me. They reported to Turner Broadcasting, a guy by the name of, oh, I'll think of his name before the show's over. Andy, Andy, Andy. I'll think of Andy's last name in a minute. But um, they were, you know, being as they should have been. I'm not being critical here. You know, once you get into a lawsuit where there are tens or hundreds of millions of dollars at risk from a legal perspective, you have to be ultra, ultra conservative and careful. And as a result of that, um, there, you know, Wade Keller reported correctly and accurately that there was an issue with the warrior leading up to that particular pay-per-view. I can't help but wonder whose idea was this, you know, as a fan behind the scenes, it feels like this is Hulk Hogan using some influence to bring in an opponent who has a win over him to get the win back. And it's been, now that's the negative side, but the realistic side is Hogan had a handful of guys he knew he could quote unquote draw money with. So he sort of relied on what worked before, whether it was a macho man or a John Tenta or an Andre, the giant, AKA big show. He sort of went with what he was comfortable with boss, man, whoever. Is that the case here? He knew that the WrestleMania six show had been something that a lot of fans still remembered fondly and they drew money with and was a big attraction. So therefore why not try it again? Or was there some man, I got to get that win back. The people want to see me get the win back brother. No, that is such a childish. I mean, it, it's, it's so ignorant and childish when I he, to, to hear the, the thought process or the commentary where dirt sheet writers or fans, not just dirt sheet, but usually it's dirt sheet, usually it's wrestling fans influenced by dirt sheet writers th that felt like, oh, Hogan is so manipulative that, you know, he really needed to get that win back. Do you really think Hulk Hogan gave a fuck no, I, I, about the win? He wanted it was the about money. the money. Yeah. It was always about the money. It was never about winning or losing. He, he lost to Billy fucking Kidman for crying out loud. It was not about winning or losing. It was always about the money. And whether he was right or wrong, um, and look, I've, I've said this before, all of us, I don't care who you are, especially if you're a producer or a writer or a booker or you're Vince McMahon or you're Eric Bischoff or whoever you are, you're going to do the things that in the past have worked for you. You're going to go back. Dusty Rhodes did it. Everybody's done it. I've done it. Vince McMahon does it still. We're going to go back to the things we know that have worked for us. And you find out sometimes they still work and sometimes they don't. You know, the audience evolves, the product evolves, and sometimes you're on the money, sometimes you're not. And this was a case where, to your, to your question specifically, yes, bringing Warrior in was a decision that was that was influenced in some not small but not major part of Hulk Hogan. You know, Hulk Hulk was excited about bringing him in. We saw, you know, put yourself in my shoes in '95. Let's go back to '94 when everybody in in the industry, the Dave Melsers, the Way Kellers, everybody else, Hogan was dead. Steroid trial killed him. Nobody cares about Hulk Hogan. He's too old. Blah, 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 blah. Now cut to 1996 when we turned the entire business upside down and WWF was on its heels. So it was hard for me necessarily to always assume that just because some, you know, same thing with Randy Savage. Everybody thought Randy Savage was over and done. 
He's too old. Vince McMahon, we're putting him out to pasture. I don't give a fuck what Bruce Pritchard says in our Monday Night Wars debate in, at, at StarCast. You know, there, there was a proposal on the table of a Randy Macho Man Savage match with Shawn Michaels, and Vince said, no, he's too old. We, I don't want to see Randy wrestle anymore. That's what brought Randy to WCW. Vince didn't want him to wrestle. Well, guess what happened? Randy Savage came to WCW, and it drew a ton of money and brought sponsorship with it. So I wasn't necessarily inclined to just automatically believe that just because a wrestler was previously a, a big hit in WWF and had stepped away for a year or two or four, that it was no longer a good idea. Right. And I was influenced by Hulk. There is no, there's no doubt about that. I was, but because, you know, my influence by Hulk was, it was also mitigated by the fact that I had experienced a fair amount of success with guys who were considered to be washed up in WWF, I uh, I was willing to take the risk. Why do sometimes you, it worked, sometimes it didn't. Why do you think that's sort of looked upon so negatively? You know, what, at the end of the day, you're still, don't get me wrong, you've had success for sure, but Hulk Hogan is the highest grossing wrestler in the history of the industry. And when he has a suggestion, wouldn't it be natural that anyone in your position would be inclined to fucking listen to the guy who's drew more money than anybody. It, it, it is, but I'll also say in fairness and as honest as I can be, um, you have to be able to balance that. So when, when and, and again, looking back at this pay-per-view now it, and I see it more, not so much in what talent we brought in. Look, Hulk suggested some talent like Randy that worked great. Hulk really, really wanted us to bring Roddy Piper in. Is anybody going to suggest that that was a bad decision or a bad choice? There were a lot of people that Hulk was, was supportive of that worked out great. There were some that sucked. And some of it was driven by personal relationships because Hulk is a very has been forever a very loyal person that was also comfortable being around people that he knew he could trust. And sometimes that, that just didn't work out. But looking back now seeing some of these pay-per-views and some of these things that you and I have gone over on Nitro, I can see, particularly when it comes to finishes, that I know there was a lot of, you know, a Hogan influence on. Hogan was doing, it wasn't manipulative. It wasn't because it benefited him, brother. You know, all, all of the narrative that has been printed for so many years about Hulk, it was because he was doing what he thought would work because it had worked previously. But I do, I, I do see things now when I go, man, and I especially saw it here, man, if I could do that over again, I would do it so much better. So let there me, was, let me clarify what you're suggesting is not necessarily that he was using some influence there for any sort of manipulation as much as it was just maybe a tired finish. It was something that had been done before and it needed a fresh coat of paint. Not this is what worked in 85 brother. Right. That was it. I mean, he was doing the same thing everybody else has done. He was doing what he knew. And to your point earlier in this question, you know, why, why would you not listen to that? Right. Especially if you're me, you know, keep in mind at this point, I'm relatively green. I'm no, I'm not relatively green. I'm greener than goose shit. How many years when, in do you think? Uh, 98. I mean, you, you took over in 94, right? So you're four years. Yeah, in. but I, I didn't really get. I, you know, I tried to stay away from creative until probably 95 or 96, really okay. 96. So you're two or three years in to really knowing what's going on. Let me correct that. I didn't know what was going on. I started to get a better feel. I didn't really know what was, I didn't, honestly, I don't know what's going on right now. You know, the business changes, everything evolves. You know, I, as I sat back and, you know, watched all in and Starcast. I don't mean watching the event because I wasn't there for the event. I don't want to mislead anybody, but watching all of the things that went into all in and watching, you know, some of the events and some of the video from, from ring of honor and, and seeing what's going on in the independent scene. That's all new to me. So I have a feel creatively now that's probably vastly superior than anything that I had in 1996. But guess what? You know, it'll be different tomorrow than it is today. But in 1998, at this point, I had really only started to get a grasp of creative. 
I had only started to get a little bit of confidence in myself because for years I avoided it. It was mysterious to me. It was like a no fly zone for me. I knew what I knew and I knew what I didn't know. And I relied on a lot of people who presumably had, or not presumably, they did have more experience than I did. But it wasn't until really, you know, the beginning of 95 and even at that, you know, my my influence over the show was more from a macro perspective based on research and things that I heard. But it was really 1996 before I grabbed a hold of storylines. Um, and by 1998, it's been 24 months in that process. And I still was very insecure. Let's and talk, justifiably so. Let's talk about some of the uh, creative here with warrior the promo is what it is i'm sure we'll cover it another time but briefly who championed the silly smoke and disappearing bullshit magic with the warriors return i mean even the announcers are trying to put it over that he's vaporized before our very eyes like what the fuck is this yeah that was you know uh just a horrible collaboration of warrior himself. You know, I, I know he's passed away and I hate talking about people that can't defend themselves or, or call me out. You know, if, if my recall is wrong or if my perception is wrong, it just bothers me as a person. But I will tell you that, you know, in, even in my negotiations with, with Jim or warrior, um, I, you know, he lived in Phoenix at the time I lived in Atlanta and I would fly out, you know, I flew out, I think twice to meet with him prior to actually negotiating with him. And I'd spend hours, like several, I'd spend hours sitting with him, listening to all of his ideas. And then he would pull out a notebook because he kept, you know, just amazing notes of just all the different ideas that he had for his character. And I'd sit there and look at this and I'd leave and I was like dazed and confused, you know, and I, I don't smoke weed or, or do any hallucinic hallucinogenic type drugs. But I, by the time I got done with him, I felt like I was doing them. I mean, I was just totally disoriented because he was all over the map and it's not, I, that's not a critique because he had a very, he had a very uh, unique view of his character. I mean, he named himself Warrior. He literally changed his name to Warrior. That should probably tell you everything you need to know. But he saw that Warrior character is something larger than, you know, comic life, if you will. He saw it as a larger-than-life comic book character, a larger-than-life wrestling character, a larger-than-life spiritual character. He saw it as such a large character in so many different ways. And he would try to kind of bring those different visions together in his wrestling character. So it was out there, brother. I mean, I can't even really explain to you some of the stuff that we would talk about. And then <laughs> after getting my brain completely numbed, I would, you know, find my way to the airport. I almost felt like I needed help because um, I was having a hard time processing just everyday thought after you know, five or six hours of that, I would get to the airport, I'd fly home. And by the time I'd get to my house, there was like 14 pounds of fax paper waiting for me with additional thoughts and ideas. So th that, that'll that kind of frame what it was like working with Warrior at the time. Again, not a knock because he was so passionate. I, I was excited about it. I was overwhelmed by it too. But he, you know, when it came time for this particular match, that was that was a lot of him. That was a lot of the character that he saw for himself. Um, that was a little bit of Hulk. That was a little bit of Kevin Sullivan. That was a little bit of Eric Bischoff. That was a little bit of Craig Leathers and David Crockett. Everybody trying to help create this character that that Jim saw for himself. And I'm not putting the heat on him necessarily because it obviously didn't work. But that was, you're asking me what was the process and that was the process. You guys are doing this show in Hartford, Connecticut. Raw is taped that night. How much of his debut was based on location and being up against a tape show? None. Just None. happened to work out that way. Yeah, believe me, 
his debut had nothing to do with anything other than what was going through his mind in the moment. It certainly had nothing to do with what we discussed prior to doing the interview. I can, I can assure you with that. I had never felt so fucking naked in my life than standing there in the middle of the ring, 20 some odd minutes into a promo that was supposed to last eight minutes. The next week you're in Chicago and you guys open up with a promo and you hold up a pen and say that it's the second most powerful tool in all of wrestling behind Hogan's arms, of course, brother. And you say that you drove using this pen, you drove Vader and Johnny B bad out of WCW sort of implying that you can do that with the warrior here. Whose idea was it to sort of wink here with the audience? Yeah, mine. I mean, that was, that was me being a smarmy, cocky, just punk of a character that was pretending to have more power than I could ever imagine I should have. That was me. So let's talk about, you know, how we get to the decision to start, I don't know, changing the dynamic of the war games because for years and years there were two teams and i think most people remember usually the horsemen were on one side and then dusty roads the road warriors whoever is on the other side who comes up with the idea of what if we did more than t- two teams i had a lot to do with that um kevin sullivan was a part of, of course kevin was supporting me you know you keep in mind you know kevin was in a tough spot to a degree uh, I mean, Kevin came up with his own silly shit. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to let Kevin completely off the hook here. Dungeon of Doom. But, you know, he was, he was doing what he could do to try to facilitate some new ideas. And that, again, context is king. What got us to the dance was doing things completely differently than they had been done before. Disrupting the normal flow of... of what WCW was creatively, talent-wise, and every other way. That's what got us to 1998. So there was a lot of trial and error. Sometimes there was more trial and sometimes there was more error. But I would say that was probably more on me than anybody else. Just like World War III was, um, there was a lot of that, let's just disrupt the mold let's break the mold let's disrupt the flow let's try something if it works great if it doesn't we'll move on that's always been my approach to life and to business it's not always great but in this case that was probably more me than anybody else well another disruptor is uh rx bars we should talk about these because you actually got some of these this past week and you absolutely loved them Because it's not just something that is good for adults. This is something that's great for kids too. And I know you've enjoyed yours. It it lists all the ingredients right there on the outside. And it's just plain and simple, good stuff. Tell everybody your experience with RX bars. Well, number one, they're delicious and they're easy to eat. And for me, I mean, I'm, you know, looking at me, you probably wouldn't know this, but I'm very, especially because, you know, as you get older, you have to be more aware of what you put in your mouth. You know, you what you eat and what you drink so dramatically affects how you feel, how much energy you have, how much focus you have, obviously your weight and all that kind of thing. But for me, you know, my weight and how I look is secondary. It's how I feel that really is the most important thing to me. And the other thing that is a challenge for me, and I, you know, I experienced this when I was in Chicago, is when you're traveling, you know, you, you get you spend six hours on an airplane. Well, the food is horseshit. I mean, it's just the the quality of the food. I don't care if you're flying a first class or not. The nutritional value of the food that you get in in an, in an airplane, uh, in a hotel, in most restaurants where the food is overly processed, it's full of antibiotics and all kinds of things. You don't really even know what you're putting in your mouth nowadays when you go out to eat. And if you're concerned about those things, you really want to know, you know, the level of carbohydrates, the protein, the sources of those protein, you know, all of the other nutritional things that go into that product. And what I like about these bars is that I can pack six or eight of them. If I'm going to be gone for two days, I'll throw enough in my bags, my carry-on, where I don't have to eat garbage food. 
and they're satisfied. They not only taste great, but they're satisfied. Even though it's a smaller bar, you don't have to sit there and eat a big giant hamburger that's mostly bread and a bunch of meat product that you're not even really sure where that meat product came from. I don't know if you know this or not, but when you eat a hamburger, you're eat, you, you look at that hamburger and you go, wow, that's from a, a cow. Well, it's actually from about 1,400 cows because it's all ground up and mixed together. You have no idea where that product is coming from. So nutritionally, I really, really dig these bars because I know exactly what I'm putting into my mouth. I know exactly the carbohydrates, the protein, all of the other critical you know, macronutrients. And they taste great and they're easy to travel with. I feel like I should mention here, you've probably seen these. They're the ones who have the egg whites for protein, dates to bind, nuts for texture, and all the other delicious ingredients like unsweetened chocolate, real fruit, and spices like sea salt or cinnamon. Let's run through some of the adult bar flavors. Peanut butter, peanut butter chocolate, chocolate sea salt, blueberry, mixed berry, and coconut chocolate. And they've got a kid's line too, man. Stuff like chocolate chip, PB&J. And maybe best of all, gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, no artificial colors or flavors or preservatives or fillers. These things are perfect for your pre or post workout, breakfast on the go, snack at the office, just keep it in your car, throw it in a carry-on like Eric does. And it's a cool little add-on to throw in the lunchbox for the kids or a sports bag or even the glove compartment. You got to hit this up, man. RX Bar is offering you an exclusive pack of six adult bars and four kid bars so the whole family is able to enjoy and you get 25% off your first order. All you've got to do is visit rxbar.com slash 83 weeks. That's rxbar.com slash 83 weeks. And then put that promo code in 83 weeks at checkout and you're hooked up one more time. rxbar.com forward slash 83 weeks and use that promo code 83 weeks at checkout and you'll enjoy 25% off. You're going to love it. Let's talk a little bit about Scott Hall. It's said here that, uh, he's getting in a little bit of hot water with a lot of different folks. And even Mike Mooneyham would report in the newspaper that he tried to play a bit of a practical joke on some of the luchadors staggers out of the hotel bar and just rams into their rental car. Thinking it's funny. Hooventu and a lot of the other guys try to confront him and ask him to pay for it. And things just continue to spiral to the point where. He's probably going to be missing some action here. You have to step in. Where are we at with Scott Hall and some of his out of the ring antics here in the fall of 1998? Yeah, definitely getting out of control. And I don't recall when Scott actually first went into rehab, but he was spinning so far out of control at this point. And this is one thing I want to point out right away in, in, you know, a couple hours ago, sitting back and watching this event, there were some things, you know, that I was pretty proud of in a way, despite the overall quality of this show. There were some things that I was, I'm, I'm embarrassed about, and I just want to get it out of the way right now. Putting Scott Hall out there and using his addiction as the basis or the premise for a storyline is something that I really, really really regret and I don't regret much. There's only a couple things in my career that I've regretted. You know, one was the way I handled Ric Flair and probably this, the rest of it, you know, I look back out and go, you know what? I did the best I could. And I learned as I went and whatever, I, I just don't regret much, but I, as watching this today, I really regret it. I just, I felt, I felt shitty about myself watching this cause you don't, you don't do that. You know, you don't glorify, you don't exploit, you, you, you just don't do that. And I did that. Was it your idea? Who pitched it yes, to him? Yes, it was my idea. And that's why I feel shitty about it. It was my idea. It wasn't Scott's idea. It wasn't, you know, Harvey Schiller didn't call me and say, Hey, why don't you do this? You know, it, it wasn't Hulk Hogan's idea. It wasn't Kevin Sullivan's idea. It was my idea. It was me doing what had worked to a degree in some situations where you take a reality, Hall and Nash, leaving WCW, becoming big stars, coming back, flipping the car over at WCW and trying to make everybody pay for it. Th that worked. 
you know, taking reality and tilting it five or 10 degrees and turning it into a, a fictional storyline was a formula that was working. You know, my issues with R- Ric Flair, th- that was a reality and we tilted it a couple degrees and put a little bit of salt and pepper on it and it became a great storyline and it worked. So there was a reason in my mind, at least incorrectly, not justifying it, that, okay, we've got this problem with Scott. Why don't we try to make that a storyline? Because everybody knew about it. There was no secret. The audience, you know, Dirt Sheets did a great job of exploiting it for clickbait and reporting on it. And I'm not necessarily, you know, clickbait's not, not fair. That's something that should have been reported. And I don't, I don't, I'm not blaming anybody for reporting it, but like, well, unfortunately I took that and went, okay, let's, let's take a negative and try to turn it into a positive. And in this case, that, that was a really, really bad choice. So let's talk a little bit about, um, what that means for Scott Hall, because allegedly the main event for Halloween Havoc is a bit up in the air. It's been speculated in the dirt sheets at the time that the idea is Kevin Nash versus Goldberg at Halloween Havoc. And we know that's not what's going to wind up happening. It does wind up becoming a diamond Dallas page Goldberg match. What else was discussed that you remember for Halloween Havoc? Did you know going in to, you know, the weeks leading into this fall brawl where you wanted Halloween Havoc to be Goldberg wise? Yes. Otherwise we wouldn't have put, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a spontaneous decision to put page over. It was probably a spontaneous decision as to how we put him over, but clearly, you know, Bill had been, you know, he had been growing as a character and he had been eating his way through the food chain. And it was now to the point where we had to start feeding him for lack of a better way of saying it, no disrespect to page or anybody else, but we had to start feeding him now credible opponents as he was as they the credible opponents were working up in terms of stature and and page was at that point a really viable character that people could have to a degree believed in it wasn't a squash by any stretch um so yeah we knew going in that it wasn't spontaneous of course, you don't just have situations with Scott Hall and drug tests and injuries. You've also got behind the scenes office maneuvering. And we've never really talked about this or not in detail. Janie Engel blindsides you and tries to resign and you attempt to mend the mend those fences a little bit, not just with her, but with everybody else. But there's also a report that maybe there was a power play from Nick Lambros that resulted in Lambros being out of WCW and now starting to work on another project for Turner. Chat me up about Engel and Lambros and sort of what went sideways here in the summer of 98. Well, there was no connection there at all. Let's first talk about um, Janie. And yeah, she did. Now, again, I'm going to back up for just a second. This is where... Again, I really hope the people that are listening to this spend the time and the money reading the Guy Evans Nitro book. Because unless you read that, unless you hear the stories from someone's perspective other than mine, it's a little hard to believe. And I can understand why people would hear me talking about this and think that I'm just, you know, fading the heat or making excuses. But this was about the time when from an internal political point of view, it was, it was getting ugly. You, you didn't see it on camera. The talent wasn't aware of it. Chris Jericho, Bill Goldberg, you know, all the people that like to talk about what was going on in WCW at the time, they had no fucking clue what was really going on at WCW at the time. The only thing that they knew was is what was happening at Nitro when they showed up on Mondays or on the house shows. That they knew, but they never got near the epicenter of what was really going on then. And it was ugly internally. It was ugly. It was stressful. I was under a tremendous amount of stress, as was everybody else. And Janie was my rock. You know, Janie was Dusty Rhodes' rock. You know, Janie was... Dusty's right-hand person, right? 
And when I kind of ascended through the ranks, because I was close to Dusty and I was close to Janie, you know, even when I first started, there was a talent. We'd all drive together. It was me and Dusty and, you know, most of the time Janie and Doug Dillinger are, are the ones that would travel together. So as I kind of ascended through the ranks and I needed, you know, my right hand person, somebody that I could trust, that I knew was loyal, that would tell me the truth, that was um, impervious or immune, I guess, to the political manipulations and all the, sh- the, the, the games the talent would play. You know, Dixie, is, uh, Dixie, oh my God. Janie had seen it all. She was very experienced. She grew up in Texas. You know, she, she came up at a very young age, you know, at a time, you know, she knew Terry Funk. She was a part of the whole, you know, beginning and end of the territory culture. So she she knew it. She was probably one of the smartest people, smart to the wrestling business people in all of WCW when, when I got the opportunity to, to be in control. So she was naturally my executive assistant, executive secretary. And everything went through Dix, uh, Janie. I wouldn't take a meeting. I wouldn't take a phone call. Nothing happened unless it went through Janie. So... And she knew where the bodies were buried. <laughs> I mean, she knew it all, not just with me under my tenure, but, you know, she was around WCW from the beginning of WCW time when Turner took it over. So Dixie was, or I keep calling her Dixie, and I'm so sorry for that. Janie was critical to everything that was going on in the office. She was kind of the central focus. And Jim Ross offered her a gig to come because Jim worked with her too. Jim knew Janie's value. No question about it, because Jim worked as closely with Janie as I did, maybe closer over a longer period of time. So when Jim went to WWE and he made her an offer, it was, you know, number one, Janie was exhausted mentally and emotionally. And I I don't want to put words in her mouth. We've talked about it subsequently, obviously. But she was mentally and emotionally drained, not only by, by what was going on internally, but my by my reaction to it. I went from being pretty easy and fun, not, not, not that I wasn't a challenge, even when things are going great, because I have a strong personality and, and a certain way of do, doing things, which is challenging for many people. But it never was a problem between Janie and I. She was a part of my family. She would babysit our kids. When Lori and I would want to go out of town, Janie would come over and, you know, my kids called her Auntie Janie, you know, and and she traveled with us. I mean, she was a part of our family. So when Jim Ross offered her a gig, between the amount of money they offered her, they meaning WWF, and the fact that she was so emotionally drained by what was going on internally, politically, and my reaction to it, she she was she called me and told me she was she was going to go, and she cried, you know, and I I was shocked, I was very emotional about it, I was devastated, and just because, like I said, she felt like part of my family. And not just me, but my wife and my kid, Lori and Janie and a couple of the girls from the office and Liz, uh, you know, Liz would all come out to Wyoming and go trout fishing together in the fall. We got, still have pictures to this day of Liz and Janie and a couple of the other, other girls that worked in the office that would come out here to where we live now in Wyoming. And they'd have, you know, what they call them girls weekends, you know, once or twice a year. I mean, that's that's how much it hurt when I thought you know Janie was going to leave and I and I did make her a big offer I, I paid her a lot of money paid her six figures to stay I, and Harvey Schiller said Eric what are you doing you know that was probably thirty or forty percent more than you know what was normally expected to pay somebody like Janie but Janie knew forty or fifty or seventy percent more about the business than anybody I could hire off the street you can't train somebody to understand the wrestling business. Nobody's going to come out of college with a master's degree in wrestling. You have to live it. You have to have gone through it in order to see it all or have at least some level of experience in dealing with the bizarre sets of circumstances that come your way as a result of wrestling. 
And then add on top of that just organizational, being efficient, being all the things that any executive assistant would need to be, but to also have the knowledge as to how to handle the unique animal that is wrestling. She was worth every nickel of it. And I, we were able to keep her. Um, I was able to keep her keep her as my assistant. I had to hire somebody to be her assistant because the workload was so heavy at that time. So I actually had two assistants, but um, the second one reported to Janie, not to me. Um, but yeah, it was it was really tough on me. Nick Lambros, the second part of the the question, um, there was no issue with him leaving, but you know he and I, you know Nick was a great great support system for me, you know, for a couple years, uh, Nick, you know, he worked for Turner legal, um, and he was assigned to WCW, but he took a particular interest in WCW that was different than most of the people from the legal department did. He, he was a, you know, some people in a, you know, Conrad, you may have experienced this in your life. You know, I categorize lawyers, you know, in, in two categories, you know, one's, you know, some lawyers are deal makers and some lawyers are deal breakers Yep. in my business, at least in entertainment. And I would say 75% of the time they're deal breakers because they're looking for ways to fuck deals up. They're looking for reasons why a deal shouldn't happen. And that's the way they're trained and the way they think and the way they think they, they, they create value. But there's a smaller percentage of lawyers that are deal makers that'll look at the same situation. You give the deal breakers and the deal makers the same legal challenge, and a smaller percentage of them will find a way to make it work. Where the largest percentage of them will find a way to make sure it doesn't work because that's the way they're safe. And they get paid either way. It doesn't matter. And Nick was one of those deal makers kind of attorneys and I recognized it in him right away. And, and he was fun to be around. He had a great attitude. Um, so I ended up hiring him. He no longer reported to legal because he didn't represent Turner broadcasting or he didn't represent WCW necessarily in any kind of litigation or negotiations, but he was great in terms of being able to facilitate contracts and, you know, streamline the legal process so that when it got bumped up to turn legal, it was pretty much bulletproof and it worked really well. The challenge with Nick and I is Nick, like a lot of people in 1998 started getting very political and started spending more time kind of wondering where he was going to land after the merger. than he was thinking about what was best for WCW. And I saw that I saw the, I, I saw it, he went from being a team player, 100% WCW, you know, do whatever needs to be done. Let's make this thing work, To, I'm sorry, Eric. I got a golf game with somebody over here next on Thursday. I can't be in that meeting. And I started seeing that more and more and more, and that created a bit of an issue between Nick and I. Well, you probably saw it because you were using Omax, and I feel like we've talked about them a lot lately, but this Omax... Three, the ultra pure is the purest omega-3 supplement on the market and i know you've been using these you can tell a huge difference and if you're looking for something to help you alleviate joint pain and muscle soreness make you feel your best especially post-workout but also improve your focus and memory boost your cardiovascular health there's just so many reasons to use omax 3 ultra pure isn't that right there is. And I'll tell you the thing that I noticed the most, because, you know, heart health is not something you feel, right? You, you, you hope it's going on because you want a healthy heart, but it's not, you don't wake up in the morning and go, wow, my heart feels great today. <laughs> but you do wake up in the morning and, and realize that, wow, my knees don't hurt. Or my shoulder, you know, that normally hurts when I wake up in the morning isn't bothering me today. Those are all benefits that I do notice. But let me tell you about one that I noticed the most that really drives me to use the product more than anything is focus. I, and, and by the way, it's not just me. It's my wife feels the same way because she's been using the product along with me. But that's what I really notice because I, you know, I have a tendency to be honest is, you know, I'll be doing this podcast with you and I'm also looking at my iPhone or I'm also looking over my shoulder at the television to see what the Vikings you know, score is against San Francisco this weekend. You know, I, I tend to not 
I don't want to say I'm ADD because everybody says that. <laughs> We're all kind of half scatterbrained and we assign, you know, a condition to it. It's just hard for me to focus sometimes. And this product really helps me focus and get into, even in this podcast, more of the detail and the minutia of the story of what was really going on behind the scenes. And I might otherwise be able to. So knowing you and I were going to get together today and we were going to record this podcast, this podcast, I doubled up, just so you know. Well, I'll tell you what, you're going to want to double up too. Omax Ultra, Ultra Pure Man, it's the way to go. Uh, and, and the reason, one of the things you've told me off air is uh, the, the, the elimination of the fish burps. This is not something I've used before until now, but you were telling me the old supplements you were using, you would get a bit of a fish burp here though. It's the absolute purest you can get, even if you freeze them and they do like a freeze test, these freeze clear because there's more of the good stuff and less of the wasteful fats, the other junk that they stick in the other brands. And that's the reason they stick a 60 day money back guarantee on this. You've got plenty of time to try it and then feel the difference. And I want to encourage everybody to go to tryomax.com. That's tryomax.com slash 83 weeks. And there you're going to get a box of Omax three ultra pure for free with your first purchase. That's right. It's free with your first purchase. Check it out. It's tryomax.com forward slash 83 weeks. And you get that first box of Omax three for free with your first purchase. Of course, terms and conditions apply, but get all the info on what's making Eric feel good. Go to tryomax.com forward slash 83 weeks. And let me, let me, I just want to follow up on that. Because here's what's great about this, Conrad. I mean, it's fun doing these and, and going back. And obviously, we're getting sponsors. And from a business point of view, it's all great. But the other thing that I really enjoy about doing this with you is that we get to sample some great products. We really, really do. And this product, Omax, is 94% pure, which is on, on the scale, is it's about as pure as you, it's almost pharmaceutical, if not pharmaceutical grade. Um, pure and when you go to a health store or you go to your local big box retailer and you're buying this stuff off the shelf half of it comes from china you don't know what's in it and that's the truth and i'm not trying to scare people but you know we don't realize what we're putting in our mouth and sometimes we're taking vitamins and we're taking nutritional supplements and we think they're great for us but this stuff is manufactured in china a lot of it in it, it's horrible what's for you. And here you have an opportunity to, to get a product that's great for your heart, it's great for your mind, and then they have a long list of other products as well, but it's pharmaceutical grade. And I can't put that over enough. We can't either. Go check it out. This is good stuff. Tryomax.com is what you need to do. Uh, forward slash 83 weeks, of course. So, Hey, let's talk about the actual show. I guess we should get to it. We've talked a long time about what's leading up to the show. And I'm sure we've got more to come. If you're curious, Hey, Conrad, why didn't you talk about Ric Flair? Because this is knee deep in the lawsuit and all that. Guess what we're doing next week here on the show, Eric. Oh God. Back to back, man. Warrior this week, Ric Flair next week. Of course, we're coming up on the anniversary of the phenomenal Ric Flair returns to nitro promo. Fire me. I'm already fired. I can't wait to do that with you next week. So tune in next week for more of the Ric Flair saga, where we get Eric groveling again saying, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, let's get to fall brawl 98 though. A sellout crowd here, but they're going to kill the fucking town short enough. Here we go. 11,528 fans paid an incredible 218,000 at the gate and spent another nearly $86,000 in merchandise. And you know here- what though? Let me, I hate to interrupt you. That's rude. And I apologize, but that is less money than Cody in the bucks drew in Chicago and less people than Cody in the bucks drew in Chicago for all in hats off. Absolutely. You know, and, and this is uh this is a Crockett stronghold here, but it is a sellout. It's all we can jam in there. Uh, let's talk about the matches and what we get kicked off with Davey boy Smith and Jim Neidhart. Take on Alex Wright and Disco Inferno. This is on a fucking pay-per-view. Quarter star is what it gets in the write-up. What say you? You watched it this week. Uh, The write-up would say, Wright was uh, actually good by himself, but not good enough to carry anyone. Their opponents seemed to be somewhere else. There were so many mistimed spots, it wasn't funny. 
It went too long and finally ended when Smith pinned Inferno after a power slam. Although it took him three tries to actually get Inferno up. And I think a lot of people maybe missed that this is when Bulldog was injured. Uh, he had landed on the trap door that was set up for the warrior. And as a result, he would, you know, suffer some long-term consequences there. And obviously you can tell from looking, he wasn't feeling his best here. What'd you think of the match though? It was a little sad to watch, at least to me. It was, and I'm going to refrain from being critical of the two guys that are no longer here to kick my ass or defend themselves. Um, I will say that watching it today, I thought Alex looked really good. You know, one of the things that I noticed in watching Alex is, first of all, he must have like a 48-inch inseam. He's the longest legs and the shortest torso of any big man I've ever seen. And one would think that would make him awkward in the ring, kind of like a giraffe. Uh, but he could, he really could move pretty well. He was a very athletic uh, young man, not not seasoned, not you know, not a Shawn Michaels, but for his build and his size, he was really good, and he did do the best of of the four men in the ring. Obviously, I thought Disco sucked. You know, Disco was a great, and I like Disco, and you know. I've, I've seen some matches that Disco has had that, you know, he should be proud of, but this was not one of them. You know, granted, Davy Boy was having some issues, but I think one of the other reasons that he had such a hard time getting Disco up is Disco was like a bag of water. He did not help the situation at all. I mean, there's ways you can make it easy, and there's ways you can just kind of be there. And I think, you know, in Disco's case, he was just kind of there. He didn't make it easy on Davy at all. And that that didn't help. It was not necessarily all Disco's fault, but that he certainly didn't help to overcome the situation in any way, in any stretch. And it wasn't just that. There was a lot. And, you know, I didn't even realize or remember that Davey had been injured um, at this point until you mentioned it. But I remember looking at that match early on and going, God, what is up with Disco? He's bumping like a bag of bricks. He normally he bumped really well. He sold really well. He moved, you know, he was very agile in the ring. He was athletic. And he just looked very awkward uh, in the even in the early portions of this match. That was one of the things that I noticed. And obviously, Davey and, and, and uh, Jim, you know, they, they didn't have their best night. When did you first hear the rumblings of the trap door injuring Davey Boy? Uh, it, it was a week or two later. And I think it probably came with a letter from a lawyer. Uh, he, he does suffer a uh, spinal infection here that nearly paralyzes him. He winds up being hospitalized for an extended stay here. So it is serious, but this is not the Davy boy that we saw main event SummerSlam a few years prior. Uh, it's clear that he's got some other stuff. That's a challenge for him in his real life. Next up, we've got a fun bit here. We've got Chris Jericho coming out to do a promo and he's going to call Mean gene. Uh, Gene mean and, and fun <laughs> stuff like that. I love this era Jericho. And then he's going to take on a fake Bill Goldberg, a guy who they've dressed up like him, but clearly doesn't look anything like him, but they do the tattoo and the toy belt and all comedy, good stuff. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and we get the fun skit, the old spinal tap. We can't find our way to the stage sort of thing. Uh, what'd you think of this, uh, Chris Jericho, Bill Goldberg, stunt it's good stuff actually i thought it was great stuff i mean i love the comedic jericho and, and for the most part even you know in, in throughout wwe there's always been a a large part of his character that you know was very comedic or had the potential to be but i think at this point at least in wcw he was at the top of his game we we're beginning to see all of the potential that, that Chris Jericho obviously went on to have. I I loved everything about this, watching it back today. The only thing I thought about, because now, I'm, you know, when I watch this stuff back, I'm starting to watch it back. Like if I was reviewing something as a producer or an executive producer, you know, if I was giving notes, which is what they say in the TV business on something, um, I probably would have made a note for Gene Okerlund to be, 
a little less convinced. You know, he he made it clear that he didn't necessarily really believe Chris, but I think I would have turned the volume volume up on Gene just a little bit so that the audience at home knew it wasn't going to be Bill. The one thought that I had watching this back is we might have gone a little too far convincing the audience that Bill was actually going to show up. That was- I think if, if it would have been set up as a little bit more of a joke, tongue in cheek, I think it would have been a little bit better because if you swerve the audience in the wrong way, swerving the audience is great when you swerve them the right way. Swerving them the wrong way just makes them angry. I guess we should mention that that's really the only critique in the newsletter is that uh, they really needed to have the real Goldberg do a run in after the match so the fans would at least see Goldberg live. And and he writes, the crowd felt ripped off since before the first match, they made the big announcement to the live crowd of a Jericho Goldberg match being added to the show. So live, I'm sure a lot of people were let down, but the newsletters didn't really rate it that high because they say it's really just a gimmick that's been done two months prior with Rey Mysterio. Uh, they only give it half a star. I think that's criminally underrated. This is some great stuff. And if you're not going to watch anything else on the show, I think you should watch this. Don't you think? I agree. I agree. I, it was in some respects, the highlight of the show, which doesn't say much. no, let's keep going. Here we go. The train is off the tracks now. So as a reminder, we had, um, the British bulldog injure himself in the first match and it was not well received next up a comedy routine with Chris Jericho, which told the show. And now Ernest Miller and Norman smiley. Five minutes and four seconds quote after a kick that totally missed coming on the heels of an already blown finish. Um, nobody cares about Miller and these two work together poorly negative one star. We'll keep going here. Rick Steiner goes to a no contest. No, let's not keep going. Let's back up. Let's back up. Cause again, in, in reviewing the show from a, a different point of view now, I'm looking at that and we all know I'm, I'm friends with Ernest and people can say whatever they want about him, you know, as a wrestler, he was still very green. He was still very new to this. And unfortunately, you know, his gimmick was that of a, of, of a martial artist. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, you know, it's, you look at Shawn Michaels, super kick. Okay. That, that, that super kick is really easy for him to execute because about 80% of his weight when Sean used to throw that kick was falling backwards. So there was no way that that kick was going to have any real impact on anybody if he was to misjudge it just a little bit. The challenge when you're a legitimate martial artist and you're throwing kicks is once that kick leaves the barrel, so to speak, It can be really dangerous. It's really hard to throw a a working legitimate kick, if that makes any sense. Working punches are easy. They're really easy to make look good. Working kicks are a lot more difficult because your your kick, you're you're throwing your leg up, which is the longest, strongest part of your body. In order to get it up head level, now add in that you're spinning 360 degrees or coming off the, the top rope at 180 degrees. You have to put so much body weight and effort into that particular kick that you could really, really hurt somebody if you hit them with it. And yeah, the kick didn't land the way we wanted it to and all of that kind of stuff. But the fact that Ernest, as big as he is, was able to get up on that top turnbuckle and do a jump backspin round kick and make it look even reasonably close. And by the way, I would criticize the cameraman more than I would criticize the kick just as a point of reference, as a producer, there's a lot of shit that I see in WWE that I know is covered by Kevin Dunn and his ability to direct because he knows how to do it better than anybody. But the one thing that I'll say critically about that match is that finish sucked. Ernest and all the buildup leading up to that match, we saw him backstage with the Armstrongs and he was, you know, he was doing his, you know, I'm the best in the world and he was being a heel and he was doing a great job as a character, you know, getting heat on himself as a heel. But that was a baby face finish in that match. He didn't cheat to win. You know, Norman Smiley was clearly the baby face. Um, There was that finish was a hero finish. I mean, and that's, you know, when I look back at it now and, you know, I'm, I'm, I can be objectionable, you know, objectionable, objective and look at this, 
the technique and the storytelling and the finishes. And I've criticized their finishes in WCW during that period of time before. This is not new. But looking at that finish, whoever came up with that finish, you know, sh- should have had a conversation with somebody because it was wrong. That finish didn't get empathy on. It didn't do anything for Smiley because Ernest didn't cheat to win. He, he, he didn't do anything wrong. He did a spectacular, or at least it was a spectacular attempt at a finish, but he did a great, cool, you know, 360-degree round kick for a finish. What's wrong with that? Now, if he would have nutshotted Smiley before or if he would have done something as a heel to set up that finish, I would have been okay with it. But just to hit his finish clean um, is as awkward as the finish was, but from a storytelling perspective, to hit that finish clean, it didn't do anything for Ernest as a heel, and it certainly didn't do anything for Smiley as a babyface. And that's what kind of pissed me off looking at that, not the fact that he missed it. Talk to me about this next horse shit. Rick Steiner <laughs> is supposed to be taking on Scott Steiner, and Scott Steiner's trying to get out of the match, and he's going to present a doctor's note with the help of Buff Bagwell. Um, to mean Gene and then JJ Dillon, and they're pointing to a band aid or a couple of band aids on Steiner's arm, saying that he's injured and he can't wrestle. And then, of course, JJ says, Nope, we covered this last month uh, at the pay per view. You've got to take on your brother. The match is going to happen tonight. And then, as soon as the match gets going, or not, not too terribly long into it, Buff Bagwell, who I have a great story on sometime, fakes. A neck injury on the apron. And of course, famously earlier in the year, he was temporarily paralyzed live on thunder, but this brings the show to a screeching halt and you guys put him on the board and it just really slows the entire show down, slide him into the ambulance. And of course, as soon as the ambulance is shut immediately, when Rick turns his back, both Scott Steiner and buff Bagwell pile out and double team him. What a fucking awful disaster this is. Negative one star is the rating, and I don't think that's negative enough. All these years later, what do you think? So before I tell you what I think, why was it so awful? Well, because I I don't know. For one, I didn't like that you guys were playing off the real injury. Two, it slowed down the entire show. It took way too fucking long. I don't think the audience cared at this point. It was very predictable. I could be armchair quarterbacking, but I just remember watching this thinking, ugh. And then watching it back this time, now, 20 years later, it's more painful than the first. I, I think if it was kept shorter somehow, maybe I could have bought into it. Maybe if this was a nitro and there's cutaways, we can go to commercial and whatever. But to just sit there and wait on this entire gurney process and all this, when you know it's a bunch of bullshit. No, you know, it, it, see, it, and I don't disagree with you in some respects. I think it did go too long. That's what that was my note. You know, this morning watching it back was wow, we could have achieved the same thing and probably saved four or five minutes. Um, but then here's here's what you don't know, as the producer, as a producer, <clears throat> if you follow a formula that the audience would accept, it's automatically a work, right? Once and 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 I gotta say, you know, watching it back this morning, the fact that it went longer than it should have made it more real. Should have, especially getting the gurney to the ring. So I was sitting there watching it this morning, and I'm going, man, this is fucking painful. Why did this take so long? I was literally, you know, making notes to myself, like, you know, (laughs) again, if I was, if Eric Bischoff, you know, in nineteen or 2018 was a producer, and Eric Bischoff from you know, 1998 was the executive producer. I'd be sending notes to myself going, why the fuck did you wait so long? Why can't you speed this up? But in the, in the, in the process of thinking that way, it also dawned on me that, cause there was a moment where I went, holy shit, this is starting to feel real because you have to go beyond the formula in order to, to shake the audience's natural cynicism a little bit. You got to put them off balance and when everybody expects when you're working an angle, oh, they're going to come out, he's going to go down, you know, Rick's going to break character, which he did very effectively in the ring. Scott broke character very effectively outside of the ring. All of a sudden you forgot about their animosity and it felt believable and real. They did a great job with that. 
And it got to the point where I'm going, man, oh man, why are they waiting so long? But it's at that point where I started to feel like, holy shit, this is starting to feel believable. So I had no problem with everything leading up to the stretcher in the ring. And again, Conrad and, and the people listening, really, you know, you're satisfying two audiences in a situation like this. You're satisfying approximately 11,000 plus people in the arena. Right. But you're satisfying a much larger percent, a much larger audience in pay-per-view. And you've got to balance the two. On television, I mean, it did kill the arena. I mean, it did. It's just like, there, Because they can't see all the TV angles that everybody else could see. You know, there were people that 75% of that arena couldn't see what was happening at ringside, right? So that really does kill the house. But the people at home saw a much more dramatic story. You know, it was more effective. Where it really lost me was the length of time it took to get him into the ambulance. Yeah. That could have been, I think the setup with the stretcher was about perfect. I thought the execution of that was as close, even in retrospect, 20 years later, being cynical and being able to be objective and removing myself from all of it. I thought that was actually done pretty well. What lost it for me was loading him into the ambulance. That took way longer than you could have achieved the same thing in a third of the time. Now, I want to go back just one bit because we skipped over it. I think that promo in the hallway. Tremendous. Scott Hall. Scott Hall. Scott Steiner and Bagwell and Gene was about the best interview I've ever seen Scott Steiner do. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are we going to gloss over that math promo from TNA? That's the best thing ever. No, and it, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But maybe I'll, I'll rephrase this. The best promo that I've seen Scott do up until that point. Yeah. He, he lost that, you know, cause he was Scott up until this point was pretty one dimensional. You know, you, you, you fire him up to a promo and the words may be a little different, but essentially the promos were always the same. He was comedic without being comedic, yep. you know, pointing to the two band-aids, one on the inside of the arm, one on the outside. I fucking busted out laughing this morning. It was watching great. That. It was great. And here's the best part of that promo and it's always the little things that makes promos great to me <laughs> and not just promos but almost everything it's always the little details that take things from being pretty good to being outstanding as that promo was coming to an end i knew it i knew it and jj was walking down and scott scott steiner's on his hands and knees picking up you know shreds of what's left of the the doctor's excuse honest to god i had to get up and use the restroom i was laughing so hard yeah, listen, that, that made my household laugh out loud too. Uh, as a reminder, if you haven't watched it, JJ Dillon tears up the doctor's note and as he's going down the hall, just throws it up in the air and buff and, and Scott were sort of trying to convince JJ as they're walking away, but immediately Scott stops and gets on his hands and knees to gather all the pieces. And it's just, it's not what you expect from Scott Steiner, which is what made it so great. It was, and that's the kind of thing, you know, we've talked about this many times in the past, and a lot of other people talk about it as well. You know, if you look at if you look at the very scripted nature of WWE today, and it is, and it is for a reason, I'm not being critical, but it just is what it is. That moment right there was not scripted. Right. That was Scott using his instinct, knowing what his character was, knowing what the story was, knowing where they were within their story, and he saw something, and he it was improv and it was magic. That was the best part of that promo. And I just, that, that's the thing that I miss so much today is that element of improv when it's done well. Let's talk about Hooventude Guerrera. You guys decided to put him in a match against fucking silver King. Uh, they go eight minutes and 36 seconds. It gets two stars. And the only thing that was really of note uh, from the newsletter is since silver King has no credibility, the fans were chanting boring early. And then later he would continue who was wearing quote, sweet surrender end quote on his trunks, which I'm told is some sort of gay deal, which someone told him to wear as a practical joke. So I don't know where that comes from, but I do want to see what you thought of Hooventude and silver King while the fuck it's on a pay-per-view. Well, it's on a pay-per-view because we are building up the Lucha element on within WCW. So you can't just say, ah, well, let's not put the luchas on. 
let's not put these guys on. We put them on Nitro. We use them in the cruiserweight division all the time. We're trying to build them up as stars on TV, but God, they're not worth being on a pay-per-view. Oh no, I'm not arguing that. I love Hoven Toot on a pay-per-view, but fucking Silver King, man. Yeah, there's no story there, which is why the audience and everybody else kind of crapped on it. And that's the risk you take when you put, you know, a hot shot. In this case, I should use hot shot very carefully. Um, the match was what the match was. Um, and it wasn't entertaining. There was no story. There were no stakes. Um, and I can't wait to talk about stakes later on in this in this discussion about the main event. But um, it... It just was what it was. It was kind of like, okay, we got to check the Lucha box and we don't really have a story with Hoovy, so let's get Silver King. We can bring him in. <laughs> That's what that was. No more, no less. Not going to try to defend it. Um, the only thing I wish in watching it back, you know, Hoovy hit, what was it, the reverse Frankensteiner? Yeah. On Silver King. And then it was a couple, you know, meaningless sequences later. And he finally hit him with his finish. I think if Hoovy would have hit that reverse Frankensteiner off the top rope and then immediately gone into his finish, I think it would people would have had a much different feeling about that match. I agree. That sequ- that those two sequences back to back would have probably put the match over in a much better way. But delaying the finish and going through a quasi roll up and whatever other things that they were doing before they got to the finish it kind of took it from oh my god to oh uh, and then oh a finish could have been much better if he would have just hit his finish right after the reverse frankensteiner let's talk about perry saturn and raven the steps are if raven wins uh saturn has to rejoin the flock but if saturn wins the flock disbands and they also add a step where canyon is going to be handcuffed to the ring post um, what'd you think here? The newsletters didn't hate it. Got three and a half stars, uh, three and a half stars. Yeah. Okay. Then, okay. Clearly there are members of the flock feeding Dave Meltzer or whatever dirt sheets that gave it three and a half stars. Since Dave's the only one that gives, gives people stars. There's, <laughs> there are you stooges. You didn't like I, it. I uh, know. Well, here's. There were some things I really liked about the match. I love the finish, by the way. I, and I'm going to talk more about the finish in a minute. What what really just embarrassed me, made me angry this morning more than anything, was how fucking stupid the steps and the stakes are with this match. Yep. Stakes, I don't care whether you're writing a movie, you're writing a book, you're watching a sitcom. I don't care what form of entertainment you, even a porn has better stakes or more meaningful stakes than this catastrophe did. What porn are you watching? Um, <laughs> what I'm suggesting is there's generally more story structure to almost any form of entertainment than there was in this. Are you for, for stakes to be believed for, for stakes to matter? If you're going to say, okay, this storyline has stakes. Okay, great. What are the stakes? Well, if Raven wins, Saturn has to be his slave. If Saturn wins, you know, Raven has to disband the flock. It's fucking dumb. That is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. And I was so embarrassed this morning because I had completely put this, completely put this facocta mess out of my mind <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> After it happened, I went, fuck it. I'm never going to think about this again. It happened. I can't unhappen in it. So I'm just going to forget <laughs> about it. I can't <laughs> unhappen it. That's great. And then you bring it up and force me to watch this shit again. And now I'm looking at it this morning and I'm losing my freaking mind because I'm thinking, who thought of this? Who thought this was a good idea? And what the fuck was wrong with me for agreeing to let it happen on national television? Because these stakes are so stupid, no one could possibly have gotten interested in this story. And then to compound that train wreck of a fucking idea, did you listen to the promo from Raven after it all happened in the ring? 
Did anybody possibly feel like that was an impassioned, meaningful promo that anybody cared about, including Raven himself? The answer to that is fucking no. You don't have to go to the WWE Network.com and watch this over again. Trust me when I tell you it sucked balls. Oh, God. Well, thank you for producing it and charging us money for it 20 years ago. I'm sorry. Can we get refunds? Who, sure. Who do we write for that? Uh, go to uh, turnerbroadcasting.com and take your take your shot. Yeah, use promo code 83 weeks. Uh, Dean Malenko up next, and he's working with Kurt Henning. Of course, uh, Kurt has uh, a long history here with the Horsemen, so... Most of the match is going to see Malenko working on Kurt's knee. Henning's going to sell it well. And then in the end, of course, Rick Rude is pounding on Malenko. Of course, Rude is the second for Kurt. Huge we want flair chance when this match starts because a lot of people assume, based on what happened last year at this pay-per-view, where Kurt would turn on the horseman, join the NWO, and slam his head in the cage, that Flair's going to be here. But, of course, he does not. Arn Anderson comes out, which is okay. Another local legend, but I do think people were disappointed because they wanted to see flair in the end. Uh, the crowd dies out pretty quickly when it's not flair half a star or sorry, star and a half. What'd you think of two of the all time greats, Dean and Kurt here? I loved it. I loved it. And Dave Meltzer can stick his stars and stars and his star and a half up his ass. That just shows you what what he his perspective really was back then Kurt Henning this match made me miss Kurt Henning even more and I know Kurt Henning has had many great matches and probably some that were much better than this but could anybody in the industry before or after sell as well as Kurt Henning no I don't think so I, I don't know that anybody ever will Kurt Kurt Henning in watching this match despite Dave Meltzer's star and a half made me realize that Kurt Hennig may have been one of the best performers in the last three decades, right up there with Shawn Michaels. Um, okay. That's it. I mean, he, and he was a big man. Shawn Michaels isn't, and it's harder for big men to be able to sell as athletically and as believably as Kurt did. Kurt Hennig embodied the psychology of a Nick Bockwinkel. And I say that probably because I grew up as a fan watching Nick. I don't want to say grew up, but I spent, you know, the early part of my um, adult life watching as a wrestling fan long before I got into the business, watching Nick Bockwinkel and Kurt. And I can see the influence of Nick Bockwinkel, who I think is one of the best in the, in the last half a century. I could see the influence of Nick Bockwinkel on Kurt just because I grew up watching Kurt or I watched Kurt grow up learning from, from Nick. And it was so evident in this match to me that it almost gave me goosebumps. And then you, you look at a guy like Kurt who not only has that psychology, he, he, it's an, he's got, he's a master at it. He just is a master at it. He's got a PhD in it in wrestling psychology so far ahead of almost everybody else in the industry today. It's not even funny. And then on top of that, he could talk his ass off. You put a microphone in, in Kurt's hands, and there's, other than Ric Flair, Steve Austin at his, in, in his peak, not, not always, but in his peak, um, and a small handful of other people, nobody could cut a promo that could be believable if it needed to be believable and on point and intense or it could be the funniest shit you've ever heard. Very few people can do that. Kurt Angle is one of them. Kurt Angle in his prime could be equally as intimidating and believable that he could literally would rip your arms and legs off of you in a match in a ring, or he could make you laugh your guts out the following night. Very few people can do that. Kurt could. And watching Dean's interaction with, with Kurt also made me realize why I'm such a Dean Malenko fan regardless of how many stars it did or didn't get next up, we've got the thing that you were embarrassed about the most, which is really saying something considering we haven't even covered warrior yet. Conan beat Scott hall in 12 minutes and three seconds. Of course, hall's doing the drunk gimmick here. 
which has turned into comedy. Vincent is going to be holding a drink for him and hall is frequently going to take swigs from it. Um, chat me up here. The match got a dud in the newsletter. You didn't enjoy it. Anything else you want to add to what we talked about earlier? No, you know, and the reason I'm embarrassed about it had nothing to do with the execution of the match. The execution of the match was probably as good as it could possibly be given the circumstances. So my embarrassment was really more philosophically and personally for allowing myself to think that taking advantage of someone's addiction was a great way to tell a story. I just, I even hate hearing myself say it again. I'm just, that's what embarrassed me, not the execution of the match. The execution was as good as it could have been. The idea sucked. So let's talk about the main event. Instead of two teams of five inside of this double cage war games, instead we've got team WCW DDP, Roddy Piper, and the ultimate warrior NWO Hollywood, Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart. And Stevie fucking Ray. And then the NWO Wolfpack, Kevin Nash, Sting, and Lex Luger. They go 20 minutes and change. What'd you think? Oh, it was bad, brother. It was bad. Where do we begin? I mean, let me, let me begin from a producer's perspective. You know, the, the much more seasoned experienced producer today versus the rookie back then. Uh, the, just the overall idea of having two cage matches and the action happening inside of a cage with those many people, horribly bad idea. You can't really produce it very well on television. It just didn't look good. You couldn't really follow the action very well on camera because there was so much going on and it was spread out all over the place because of the two rings side by side. And then, Oh yeah, let's make it even more difficult and, and cover the action in two rings with a chain link fence. Um, so just from a visual production point of view, it was horrible. It was a horrible idea and it came off even worse on television. I think from a live event point to a large degree, same criticism, um, there's just too much going on. You know, what, when, one of the great things about professional wrestling and one of the reasons why it's worked since the beginning of television time is essentially the stage is a 20 by 20 or 18 by 18 platform in the center of an arena, and it keeps everybody's attention focused on one point. And that's why it's easy for the most part or potentially easy to tell a story uh, on that platform because everybody's looking at the same thing. And you just let the story play out there. In this case, you've got two rings camouflaged with cyclone fence, and there's all this stuff going on, and you can't really get sucked into the story. It's like going into a movie theater and having six screens happening all at the same time and trying to follow all of those movies simultaneously. You just can't. And that's that's th what I was thinking as I was watching this from – from a different perspective was from that of which, you know, when I produced it and conceived it. So that, that's a, that was an issue. Um, the, obviously the whole warrior thing was, we've already kind of covered that. That was just, you know, a, a, a conglomeration of ideas and input and everybody trying to make a really bad idea work. And they didn't. It just was silly horse shit. Um, it didn't do anything for Diamond, uh, Diamond Ellis Page, because when he finally, at the very last, you know, moments of that, um, the uh, time uh, time limit, to you know, kind of roll over in a last gasping breath, get the win. It certainly didn't make him look good. It, it didn't set him up as a potential real threat. To Goldberg, which is what that that match should have done, it should have done two things. It should have been it should have built heat between uh, Warrior and Hogan. That would have been you know the second most important thing. The first most important thing would have been to set up Diamond Dallas Page as a guy who might actually be able to find a way to beat Goldberg. Those those are the two things that should have happened in that match. 
in order for, at least as a producer on paper, for someone to go, you know what, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to lay it out. And here's what we're going to achieve. We're going to advance Warrior Hogan. And we're going to set up the best way possible Diamond Dallas Page and Goldberg. That's what it should have done. And it didn't do either. The Warrior Hogan thing was just so hokey and cornball and unbelievable that it just, at best, it left Warrior Hogan in neutral. Realistically, it probably made me less interested in seeing it because it was so hokey. Um and it certainly didn't advance in a credible, believable way DDP and Goldberg for the following month. The hokey smoke disappearing act thing and then him running back down and then him kicking his way through the cage. It's just, God. I know. I know. Here's the real I'll, question. I'm sure he's I'll a give nice you your money back next time I see you. <laughs> I'm sure he's a nice guy. But what the fuck was Stevie Ray doing in this? Oh, I think it was more than anything. Our attempt to get Stevie over, you know, I mean, we, we've been having a lot of success with Booker, you know, Booker kind of got a lot of the attention. We saw a lot of value in Stevie and we thought this was a good role for him. And this was our way of attempting to kind of elevate him and move him up the food chain. As if this, you know, couldn't end soon enough. Here's what Meltzer would write. We're talking about Warrior. Oh, here. great. I got to listen. Now, on top of everything else, I got to get dragged through the fucking mud on this abortion of a main event. I got to get dragged through the mud on the Misfits or the Perry Saturn Raven shit. And now I got to listen to what Dave Meltzer had. By the way, did you see that gif of him? On, uh, Wait, on Twitter. Let, let me just ask, why do you have such a bug up your ass about Dave? I thought everything I was know. better. It, and then all of a sudden it feels like since Starcast, it's fucking worse than ever. Well, no, I, I haven't said much about him since Starcast. He may have been saying things about me. I haven't said, I don't think I've said anything about him until this morning. Somebody sent me a video clip of him, you know, busting out in this creepy fucking laugh with his tongue wagging like a dog. I mean, he looked like somebody you would definitely want to keep away from an elementary school. Oh I don't my know. God. You should be ashamed of yourself. What's wrong with you? Why? <laughs> that's, that's, that's heinous. Come on now. That's, that's not, not heinous. I'm, I'm being funny. I'm a comedian right now. Well, but people are going to take that very seriously when you're making fun of someone's appearance and saying that they shouldn't be allowed in your schools. Come on, dude. I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fucking not. Oh my God. You're Wait. laughing. No, I'm laughing that you think it's funny. Like we're going to go get... back and look at the clip and you tell me if I you don't saw agree with it. Me. And I was like, what is Eric doing? But either way, all right, let's move on. I think you're going to agree with, with Dave here, who, by the way, could not have been nicer to me. I don't know that I told you this. Did I tell you that? Uh, no, I probably shouldn't. We'll move on. No, but, go ahead and tell me. Let's, let's lay it out here. What did he tell you? That, I'm friendly. What did he tell you that made you feel good? Other than the fact you probably increased his sales by about 200%, just given the fact that on our show and on your show with Bruce and probably Tony, although I haven't listened to you and Tony, probably given him more exposure than he's been able to find for himself in the last 20 years combined. Well, I just, I like those guys. I get along with them. So I don't, I don't have the same perspective you do, but I understand that they wrote bad things about you. So you have a sore spot and your butt hurt and now you're lashing out. That's not really true, but whatever. <laughs> All right. Here's what he wrote. Finally, he kicked his way out of the cage and dropped to the floor. And in doing so twisted his ankle. He left after Hogan for a pull apart in the aisle. And in the pull apart, he suffered some sort of minor bicep tear. Is this real in that small amount of action that warrior did here? He injured his ankle and his bicep. I have to go back and he. He was definitely hobbling. I'll give you that. No, he was hobbling. That was obvious. And I, I know I saw that. Now the bicep tear, I don't know if that's true or not. I do know that he suffered a torn bicep and I'm not sure if it was, it had to have been after this when he was hanging from a cage. Um, I believe he was trying to get out of a cage or doing something in the cage or doing something where he was hanging 
I'm pretty sure it was from a cage, and he tore his bicep, and he was out. I mean, I put him out. So this may have been a precursor or, or kind of an early injury that led to that. I'm, I don't recall the, the, the bicep injury. It may or may not have been true, but he was definitely, he definitely hurt his ankle. Well, you wait until next month when we cover Halloween Havoc with the flash paper and the, oh, that whole thing. Meltzer gives you know, just this. maybe I'm watching this today, you know, it, it, people that have worked with me behind the scenes, guys like Bully Ray and, and, you know, Taz, you know, and TNA, um, cause that's when I really, by the time I got to TNA, I was so adamant about gimmick matches. I just hate them. I hate producing them. I hate watching them. I hate trying to pretend I like them. I just hate gimmick matches. And, you know, in TNA, we did so, they did so many of them. I said, they, we, we did so many of them. They had an entire pay-per-view that was nothing called lockdown, but gimmick matches for no reason. And if I see one more person reach under a, a ring and pull out a garbage can or a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire or a pizza tin or a pie pan and hit somebody with it and watch him try to sell that, I'm going to fucking gag. Could we please stop with gimmick matches? But the reason I feel so strongly about gimmick matches is exactly because of what you forced me to watch today. That, that, and it was my bad. It was on me. I'm not criticizing anybody but myself. That was horrible. I hate gimmick matches. Give me story. Give me action. Give me something that's at least give me a reason to want to believe it could be true. I guess we should mention here that you guys did fuck up a good gimmick match because war games was one that fans really enjoyed, but here you've changed the rules to where no longer is it surrender it's pinfall or submission. And it can end before everybody's even in the match. And instead of it being teams, which I guess technically it is, the winner gets a title shot with Goldberg. So really it's a fucking free for all with nine dudes. And you two know, you know what though? I, I will say that. And I'm glad you brought that up because we didn't cover it in the beginning of this. I, you know, as I'm, I was, I was watching Michael Buffer, you know, Tony Schiavone did a good job laying it out earlier on. And Mike today, by the way, let's, let's go back up, you know, back up just a little bit. I thought Mike and Tony and Bobby did a great job with this. And if, if you go back and you look at the ev- evolution of two man and three man broadcast teams, I thought Mike today was at his stellar best. Now he may have done better. There may be, you know, shows that were actually better than this. And I don't, you know, have recall of them at this moment, but what a great balance between Tanae being kind of like the professor and having just, you know, minutia in detail and, and layers of color that Bobby wouldn't have. Bobby was kind of like inside the mind of the talent and as the heel, you know, being entertaining, but still, you know, framing the character of what was going on inside of the ring. He was great at that. But, you know, Tanae was able to balance that with background that the average fan may or may not have been aware of. And he did such a great job at that. And of course, Tony was calling the action as it was happening, the important action. And I, I, as I was watching that today and I'm thinking, you know, I know certain people, you know, some people like a three man booze. Some people don't. I think usually it has a lot to do with who the three people are in, in the booth. But for me watching this back and seeing the, the great balance of those three guys, because they weren't, they weren't stepping on each other. You know, today wasn't doing what Tony should have been doing. Tony wasn't doing what Bobby should have been doing. Bobby wasn't doing what today should have been doing. Today wasn't trying to be the heel, you know, funny announcer or entertaining announcer. They just complimented each other in a way that generally I don't see at least not to this degree. So hats off to that, that trifecta. Well, hats off to you for making it to the end of this horse shit. Uh, Meltzer would, would finish his uh, review by saying after the match, the live crowd was pissed about the match. Um, the warrior gimmick, which is dying in every city and the night in general, booing heavily and throwing things at the announcers, etc. This was one for the record books, negative four stars. I think negative four stars is pretty right on the money for the main event. What say you? I 
can't disagree with the main event. I mean, it is what it is. It was what it was. I'm not going to try to pretend it was any better than it was. I would say the overall show probably doesn't deserve that. There were there were there were some great spots in that show. I mean, the Henning Malenko match being one of them. I think that you know, despite the fact that I hated the stakes as discussed in the, whatever it was called, the Misfit match or Raven's Flock match or whatever the fuck it was. I thought the finish was great. It was a three-dimensional finish when uh, Canyon was handcuffed, you know, to the ring and 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 Saturn, you know, w- was, I can't remember the exact sequence of the finish, but at some point the referee was down and then, Canyon was able to, you know, he reached inside of the referee's pocket. He got out the key. He was able to escape. I mean, just when you thought, you know, Perry was going to lose, Canyon actually went back, re-handcuffed himself, woke up the referee, and you thought, okay, this is over. Saturn's going to get beat here. Boom. They turned it around, and they reversed that. Then it looked like, you know, he's not going to win it again, and it looked like, uh, Raven, or Raven was going to come out on top, and then boom, they changed it again. I just thought it was a three-dimensional finish that I really, really enjoyed watching, despite the fact that the stakes, the story premise, and the promos on the front and back of it sucked. The match itself was pretty good, and I thought the finish was great. What say you? Chat me up. I thought this was uh, one of the worst pay-per-views ever, but it's only going to get worse next month when we get to Halloween Havoc 1998. But before we get there, what's coming up next on 83 Weeks? Well, it's the September 14th, 1998 Nitro when Ric Flair returns to Nitro. We're going to talk about all the behind the scenes wrangling, the back and forth, exactly what was going on during the big absence, what was said, what Eric regrets, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then, of course, the famous promo, fire me, I'm already fired. What a night it was at the Bilo Center. I'm looking forward to that, probably more than you are. Fair to say? Uh, Of course you are. Of course you are. You love seeing me squirm. You love, you can, you can feel me squirm all the way to Huntsville, Alabama. I'm sitting here in Cody, Wyoming, squirming. I get uncomfortable. I have to admit, you know, when I shit the bed. And you love hearing that. So, yeah, of course you're looking forward to it. Well, tune in next week. And in the meantime, check us out on Patreon. You're going to get these shows early and ad-free. We're going to do uh, some questions. If you've got questions about this particular episode, all about Fall Brawl 1998, any sort of warrior-related questions, you'll be able to ask them there on Patreon. And Eric will do a little Q&A action for us. All sorts of stuff you can check out at patreon.com forward slash 83 weeks. Of course, Eric occasionally goes live on Twitch as well. Twitch.tv forward slash 83 weeks. And there might even be some gaming action on there in the very near future. Please support our sponsors. And of course, follow us on our social media accounts at 83 weeks on Twitter and Instagram. He is at E Bischoff. I am at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. And we are out of time. We'll see you next week right here on 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff.